Uh, as you know, today, or as you don't know for today, we are starting a new uh, book in the Bible. We're going to study the book of James. And we're in today we'll kind of be more or less an introduction to that book, what, what it's about, what it's trying to teach us, um, how it correlates with the rest of Scripture, as all Scripture does, and how it validates other Scripture and, and fits in with other Scripture. So uh, today, let's go ahead and let, we'll read the first 12 verses in James chapter 1, and then we'll consider uh, not so much the Scripture, but, but what the entire book is going to be teaching us, and kind of make that as the background for our study of James. So I'll go ahead and read James chapters one, James chapter one, verses one through twelve. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again so much for your word. Thank you so much for the apostles that you have sent before you with these words that they have written that have been preser preserved throughout the ages uh, to uh, draw your elect to you. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the this uh, study that we embark on today and we pray that as we uh, consider the words in James and the message in James that he gives us that we will understand uh, the purpose of that uh, and that it will just grow us to love you more and more. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so like I said, this is an introduction to James and uh, we've got your hand out there. Um, James is a letter that uh, really puts forth a uh, application of uh, the things that Jesus taught in the Bible. It, it, it's, it, some people think it's kind of a works-based letter, and some people don't even like it because of that. They say, well, you know, it it's, it's emphasizes too much about the works and the things you do. But it's not. It's really a, a way that we can test whether or not we have true faith uh, by what we are doing and why we do what we are doing. And so I start this here, you know, testing and examination. Um, uh, anything in the world that is valuable needs to be tested really to determine its true worth. And, it, and is it real or is it a fake? Is it a counterfeit? And that's, uh, that's, that's just part of, we understand that. Uh, anything like precious metals, you know, gold, they have to be melted down. The dross has to be uh, getting rid of for them to be precious. Uh, certain jewels like diamonds need to be tested. You know, they have to be looked at under that, whatever that's called, that monocle or thing that they look at to determine if it's a true gem or if it's a fake. And they can tell that by close examination of it. Uh, or is it a, a cheap imitation? So. And even in life, you know, certainly our relationships, they get tested all the time, and we should test them uh, as well, including our friendships. You know, we, we get, our friendships get tested, and we, out of that we found out, is it a true friendship or, or, nothing, or something else? Certainly business partnerships, they get tested as well to find out if it's a, um, it's a good partnership and it's a true partnership, or is one person uh, out for something more than the other. 
And certainly our marriages get tested on a daily and a minute by minute basis as well to test if it is true and it is a true marriage as well. But really the most valuable commodity I think I put on there is, is our salvation. And so if we want to know if we are truly saved, we must test it and we must examine it closely. It will be tested from the outside for sure, but we must also examine it as well. And, and testing that, that's, that's a biblical concept uh, because there are many, many people out there, and you know this, that will profess Christ. But if they tested their faith against what the Bible says a Christian does, they'll fail the test. Many will. And there are many that profess Christ that when trials you know, get, they, they, they fall away. They're the rocky soil in that parable of soils. You know, as soon as the heat comes upon them, they, they fall away. They profess it initially, but they fall away. The statement that you should never doubt your faith, uh, that once you pray that prayer, you're fine, and I've heard pastors say that before, that you should never doubt your faith, that is unbiblical. And that is uh, straight from Satan as well. Because the testing of our faith is really what gives us assurance that we are truly saved. And that's what the book of James really does. He states all these things that you must do, uh, like uh, faith without works is dead, you know, things like that. He talks about the tongue. You shouldn't curse God and, I mean, curse man and bless God with the same tongue. You shouldn't, you know, that's not the way a Christian Act. So these are all really ways to examine ourselves um, to see if we are truly saved, see if we are truly in the faith. And that's certainly examining yourself is something that is um, was taught in the Old Testament as well as the New. I listed a few um, Bible verses to you, and I'll just read them to you. There in the Old Testament, Psalm 17:3 says this: "The Psalm of David." He says, "You have tried my heart; you visited me by night; you have tested me." And you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. So he's asking, even though he thinks he's doing well, he's asking to be tested. by, the, by uh, And he has been tested by the Lord. And in Psalm 26, another Psalm of David, David says this. He says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Again, he thinks he's doing pretty well by what he's doing. And I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Verse 2, prove me, O Lord, try me, test my heart and my mind. So even though he thinks he's walking in the Lord, he's asking the Lord to test him, to try him, to prove who he is and that his salvation is true and that he loves the Lord. Lamentations 340 says this, the, the prophet Jeremiah says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. That was given to the nation of Israel as they were worshiping other gods and going their own way. Um, Prophet Ezekiel says um, this about being tested. And speaking, uh, he says, Because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions, from who he's talking about here, he, he considered and turned away, uh, he will surely live and not die. Because he considered what he was doing. He examined the things that he had been doing. Prophet Haggai says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hope, uh, Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And he says that later again in verse 7 as well. Consider your ways. Examine yourself. Consider what you're doing to examine yourself. In the New Testament, Galatians 6 4, Paul tells the Galatians that each one should test his own work. Uh, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, not his neighbor. So we can't rely on anybody else's faith. Uh, we can't rely on that, uh, uh, that family faith that they did and consider we're um, uh, saved by uh, something that we were born into. And then when we use often in, in 1 Corinthians 11, before we take uh, communion, before we... Uh, uh, um, Consider that, we say that often, we must examine ourselves. It says, let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We must examine ourselves. And 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says it about as plainly as you can say it. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Uh, test yourselves. 
Or do you not know and realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test? So we are told and commanded in Scripture to examine ourselves. And that's what, um, that's what uh, really James focuses us to do. It's just really a series of tests that we look at to determine and to uh, decide, and not decide, but to see if we are in the faith, that we are doing things. We have to consider our ways. So the evidence of um, true salvation uh, is really outlined in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave us. So turn to Matthew chapter 5, if you would, and, and, um, and to really examine ourselves for true salvation, we must ask us these questions that are outlined there. Um, it's... Uh, a true salvation is characterized by a humble, contrite spirit which mourns over its sin, it understands it, what the seriousness of its sin and what that has done to himself uh, and the world. A heart that seeks after God and his righteousness, not the world's, and that's a new heart that we have gotten if we have been regenerated. And then a life of good works which flows out of that new and changed heart. That's the idea of, of, uh, of uh, true salvation. So the Sermon on the Mount now, Jesus again is teaching the people um, what it means to be part of the kingdom of God because the Jews had this, again, you understand the works righteousness mentality that the more they did, the more they uh, were part of the kingdom of God, that it was all based on what they did, and especially the Pharisees and the ones that were teaching them that they, the Jesus was speaking to all of them when he says this. He said, no, the kingdom of God is characterized by these things. And then he begins in um, uh, ch Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 3 to 12, to kind of tell us the the attributes of someone who is truly saved, the attributes of those that are in the kingdom of God. And as we go along there, you've read these before, they're poor in spirit, they're humble. That one of the attributes that being part of the kingdom is. They mourn over their sin. They, they understand that that sin, what it's done and the seriousness of it, and they mourn over that. Um, they are, they are meek, not from the standpoint of wishy-washy, but again, meekness is that power under control. They are not um, overly aggressive, things like that. Um, they thirst for righteousness. They want to be more and more like God. They want to be more and more like Christ, and they thirst for that. Uh, and that characterizes them. They, they demonstrate mercy. They're merciful. They're peacemakers. They don't agitate they don't start fights they're the ones that settle down they're pure in heart again a regenerated heart by christ will be pure in heart it will be something that will um it will be different it has different desires different uh, everything as well uh and then they will endure persecution joyfully not an easy thing to do not an easy thing to do but that will characterize those that are part of the kingdom of God. And then in verses 13 through 16, if you go by, their life will be a testimony to those uh, changed heart and those attitudes that they now have that have been given to them by this changed heart. They will become the salt and the light to the world. You're, it will be evidence of who they are. And in verses 17 through 20, uh, they will have a commitment to the world, word. Uh, Christ came to not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, and whoever does these things and follows the world will be great in the kingdom of God, is what it says here. So they have a commitment to do what Jesus says, what the word says. And in verses 21 to 48, it, it, it demonstrates that the righteousness that they perform comes from the heart. It's not the external actions they do, uh, such as... Well, you don't murder, but you do get angry, right? The anger's in your heart, but you didn't physically murder anybody. So it goes to the, uh, Jesus says that you've already sinned if you have that anger in your heart. So it comes from a, a heart, uh, it's, it begins in your heart, I guess. Whatever actions you perform begins in your heart uh, 
talks about lust. He said, you know, you don't commit adultery, but if you've looked at a woman in lust, you've already sinned as well. So those are things that, uh, that he says. And, and when he talks about in this thing, uh, it, it also refers to oaths that they take because the Jews were real good about the oath, oaths that they would take. They would, they would twist them enough to make them happen, make them benefit themselves. And he says, no, let your yes be yes, your no be no. You know, that's that's the way you should treat that. And you should you don't retaliate for retaliate. You turn the other cheek and you love your enemies. Again, a very difficult thing. And not only do you love them, but you pray for them. You pray for those who persecute you. So everything begins in the heart. uh, And it's not necessarily the external actions you do themselves. um, But those external actions you do now will come from a changed heart and will demonstrate your true salvation, who you are. Then in chapter 6, he, he talks about, uh, Jesus talks about how to worship correctly. You don't do it to be seen by men, uh, which is what the Pharisees were doing. If they fasted, they, you know, looked all worn and people knew they were fasting. So, you know, they were doing it to be approved by men. Um, and then how to pray. He taught us how to pray as well. Uh, and in verses 19 through 34, we have, he tells us about a right relationship with money and material things. You know, your treasure's in heaven. It's not here on earth. And, and true salvation, have that right relationship with that. Uh, doesn't mean you have to be completely poor, but it means you have to understand that what you have has been given to you by God. And your treasure doesn't lie in this earth because you can't take any of that with you. Um, so you don't be anxious. You can't be anxious about what tomorrow is going to happen. You know, verse 33 there, you seek the kingdom first and all these things will then be added to you. That's kind of the key to that. Um, and then in chapter 7, right relationships with others. We don't, we don't judge others. We, um, we, uh, we abide by the golden rule. And in verses 13, 14, he mentions a narrow gate and the broad gate. Okay, we, uh, it's obviously a narrow gate that enters into heaven as well. And then the very next section, he begins to talk about the false teachers and the lying prophets that are trying to get you into the broad gate, the way to destruction, not the way to eternal life. And so he ends the chapter by saying that many on that day are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do that? Didn't we do this for you? And he said, Lord, I never knew you. Because they believed the false teaching, the wide gate, that their works were going to get them there. Uh, You know, you need to base everything, as he says, on the foundation of Christ, on that rock, uh, which is how he ends a chapter. And then uh, understand that um, uh, that when the storms of life come, and they will come, which is what we'll talk about probably next week, uh, you can resist, you can hold fast, you can stand still. So that's kind of the, the background where, where Jesus describes the true, um, true salvation. This is, this is how it looks. This is, this is how it works. It starts in the heart, but it ends up in a, a life of uh, good works as well. It's not the good works that get you there. It's the regenerated heart that Christ gives you. So, so the book of James is kind of like a, almost a commentary on that or a practical application of these things that Jesus taught because it'll, it's going to command you that you do this, this, and this. And if you're not doing this, this, and this, you ought to be looking inside and testing yourself about why aren't you doing this, this, and this. Um, so it's really kind of a series of tests for uh, true uh, salvation. Uh, and many of them, uh, as we'll go along, uh, he uh, talks about hearing the word and doing the word. He talks about faith and works. Um, he talks about the tongue, about what you say. Um, he war- warns us against worldliness. Uh, he warns us of, of, of boasting about tomorrow because we know that a sovereign God, we don't know what tomorrow holds for us, right? So why should we boast on that? That's, that's a sin to boast on what you're going to do. Uh, and then it's a testing of your faith. So the... Uh, The book of 1 John is another good place that you can go to look if you want to test yourself on your faith. It's a good way of validating ourselves by uh, determining what are we saying that we are and what are we doing. And 1 John is very clear about that. And a few of the verses I I, I listed there, 
I'll just read uh, some of them. Um, say this in 1 John 2, 3 and 4. And by this we know that we have come to know him, and by knowing him mean being one with Christ, being saved, if we keep his commandments. Hmm. And whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So keeping his commandments, if you're striving to keep his commandments uh, through a heart that wants to please God, you know, you can get some, re some assurance there of your true salvation. If you're not doing that, if you're willfully disregarding his commandments, the truth's not in you. You're a liar. You're not who you say you are. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 John, it says, Whoever says he is in the light, saying, I have Jesus, I am, I am part of that, uh, and hates his brother, is still in the darkness. So another test for salvation, if you think you are, do you... You love your Christian brother, or do you hate your Christian? Do you want to hang out with your Christian brothers? Um, and then one we know, if you're professing that you know Christ, uh, but your life hasn't changed from the world, or you're placing things of the world above him, uh, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if you place in that love of the world above the love of Christ, you don't have Jesus. You don't have the Father. You don't have true salvation. Because for all that's in the world, the desires of flesh, the desires of the eyes and pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. Chapter 3, verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God. So this is one way you can test yourself. This is, are you part of the children of God? And who are the children of the devil? Pretty good test. Okay, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Again, two tests there. Are you doing the things that he's telling you to do by practicing righteousness? And do you hate your brother or do you love your brother? A couple of other tests as well. And my favorite, verse, chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God we keep his, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. So we keep his commandments not because he tells us you must do this to be saved. We keep his commandments because we love him and we know that his commandments are what's best for us. So we do it out of a heart that, uh, so they don't become burdensome. If we're doing something, and most of us grew up with kids and your parents told you to do something and you didn't want to do it, right? So you did it out of that grumpy heart. Well, that's, that's what he's talking about here. These commandments now are not burdensome. You do them because you love them. We should have all loved our parents. Oh, yeah, Dad, I'll do that. Uh, but that sometimes we don't do that. So, so that's another, another way of kind of testing your faith, and, and that's what, uh, what uh, the book of James is really telling us. So he's really telling us that a, um, the profession of faith, though, without a changed life, uh, is not true salvation. Okay, there, there will be a change. I mean, James wants his readers to put their faith to the test. Now, the, the book of James is, is, as I mentioned earlier, is a lot of times criticized because it talks a lot about works and what you do. And uh, many will say, well, that, that is total opposite of what Paul's teaching. Paul's teaching is all by grace, and here, James is all talking about these works and stuff. Uh, the audience that James is speaking to is presumably Christian, okay? It's the uh, brothers of the dispersion, so, you, so you're assuming they are Jewish Christians that have made a profession of faith. And so Paul, in his letters, is talking about the, the grace of God as how we receive that salvation, right? I mean, it's all by grace, by his grace to us. Uh, but James is how is that salvation then revealed in our life? So he's speaking to those that have already professed Christ, and is this what you're doing? This is what you should be doing if you profess Christ. So there's really no um, uh, contradiction there at all. You know, many times people like to point out contradictions, but there's no contradictions there at all. All right, so James. Who's James? All right, that's a good point. Uh, obviously a common name. 
James. In the Bible, there's really a, only four of them that it could be that I, I listed there for. The first one is James, son of Alphaeus, who is one of the twelve. He's mentioned in the list of the twelve uh, apostles as well, son of Alphaeus in Matthew 10.3. It's also mentioned in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, that, uh, that Matthew, or Levi, the tax collector, dad was also Alphaeus, that he's a son of Alphaeus. So is James' brother with Matthew? Possibly so. Um, Calvin thinks that the author of this letter is, is that particular James. And uh, Matthew Henry even says that. They think that's a particular James. But I think tradition over the years has... It's come to um, evidence that it's probably not that one, but, it, but it's someone else, a different James. The other James that's mentioned, uh, James, father of Judas, in Luke 6, 16, which is just, a, again, a list of the apostles. It speaks of the apostle Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas, the son of James. But we don't know anything more about that James. We really don't know anything more about James, the son of Alphaeus, other than he was listed as the apostles. But there's another James that we know a lot about, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right? I mean, he, he was one of the inner circle with, with Christ. He, he and, and Peter, he and his brother John and Peter were all part of that inner, inner circle. But James was martyred early. He was martyred immediately after. In Acts 12, if you recall, Herod uh, put him to the sword and then he... Then he arrested Peter because the Jews liked what he was doing, martyring those guys, so he arrested Peter as well. And James and John, if you ever notice, and I didn't know this was pointed out to me, that they, they're always mentioned together, except when he was martyred. That's the only time James alone is mentioned in the Bible. So then that brings us down to James, the brother of our Lord. And so let me just give you a few little, let's kind of go uh, through this and why we think that's who that is that wrote this. And um, first of all, we'll skip to the New Testament, we'll, we'll come back, well, well, we'll skip to Galatians and then we'll come back to uh, some of the Gospels. But in Galatians 1.19, uh, Paul writes to the church of Galatia, um, and he's given an account of his salvation. You know, that the Lord saved him, you know, on the Damascus Road. He didn't immediately go back to Jerusalem because remember, Saul was not real popular with the Christians at this time. And so if he went right back to Jerusalem, they're, I don't know what they do to him, but they would not accept him wholeheartedly. So he didn't immediately go back there, but he went to uh Arabia, then Damascus, and then eventually went back to Jerusalem and, and spent some time with Peter, spent 15 days with Peter, it said. And while he was there, in, in this verse in Galatians 1, 9, while he was in Jerusalem, he said, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, our Lord, the Lord's brother. Okay, so he describes the James that he saw and, and describing him in a manner that he was an important uh, part of the Jerusalem church there, the first Christian church in Jerusalem. And then in uh, chapter 2, verse 9, 14 years later, he's describing here, he comes back to Jerusalem as well. And when he comes back, he, he, he tells him this, and when James and Cephas and John, Cephas again is Peter, so when James and Cephas and John, who seem to be pillars, so here James is now described as a pillar in the church of Jerusalem. And when they perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and, and they would uh, take the gospel to the circumcised. So he's described as, you're getting the idea, the, the, the James that we're talking about here is a leader in the Jerusalem church. Now, the Catholics believe that... Um, that Mary was perpetually a virgin. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus had brothers and sisters, right? Half brothers at best, um, but, but he had brothers and sisters that he grew up with. Um, we know that he, in, uh, in Matthew, that uh, before they came together, Mary was found with child uh, by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then in Matthew 1.25, he said, but Joseph did not know her uh, until she had given birth to a son. And then in Luke 2.7, he says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. 
So that's going to pretty much tell you that's the first of, of other sons that she was going to have. Um, and then this, and, and they're listed a couple of places, which we'll go here in just a second. As you recall, then, when Jesus started his ministry then, um, and he went back to his hometown of Nazareth, and they, they knew who he was because he grew up there, right? And that familiarity did not work out really well for him because they didn't believe him. They had seen him as a child. And so uh, there, there's a, and back up, there's also a lot of uh, tradition in the Catholic Church that Jesus, when he was a small child, would heal uh, or bring back to life little um, animals and things like that and perform little uh, miracles as a child. And now if he had done that, I think people would have known growing up that there was something different about this kid. But it, his first miracle didn't happen until he turned water into wine in Cana after he started his ministry. So that, you know, with that background, uh, you know, this in Matthew 13, correction, Mark 6, 3 there, I think it's highlighted, it says, this is at, uh, in Nazareth when he preaches in the synagogue there in Nazareth. And the people say this, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And, and are not his sisters here with us? So he had brothers and sisters, and they took offense at him. They took offense at him because they knew who he was. They'd seen him grown up. And it's kind of reiterated in Matthew 13, 55. It says, is, is not this the carpenter's son? It, is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James and Joseph and, and Simon and Judas? So he, he's got other brothers. Jesus has other brothers. And if you notice, James is always listed first here. So he's probably the oldest of the other brothers. Okay. Um, and... Uh, uh, and, and in several occasions, but his brothers were kind of like his, uh, the people at Nazareth, too. They, they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. Again, they had grown up with him and they had seen him. Not that he was sinful, but he probably always did the right thing, and that probably made him mad as well. Um, but in Mark chapter 3, as you recall, when his ministry started now, and things were getting, people were beginning to follow him and stuff like that, and they... It, the, his mother, Mary, and his family, his brothers and stuff, and brothers and sisters, thought maybe he was crazy or maybe they were wanting to uh, get him away because things were getting maybe out of hand with his ministry. In Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 31 and 32, it says, His mother and his brothers came. Standing outside, they sent to call to him. And a crowd was sitting outside, uh, and a crowd was sitting around um, him and they said to him your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you but we know they didn't believe him because in the next verse it's listed here john chapter 7 and the, this is when he is uh, again at home in nazareth but a festival was about to begin in judea and jesus didn't go and his brothers kind of sarcastically were chiding him that you should go because because you need to show who you are, but they're saying it in a derogatory sense. And probably you can get the sense here as we read this. He said, so his brother said to him, leave here, go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. So they did not believe that he was who he said he was. But that changed. That changed for James. If you look at the next verse listed here, Acts 1.14, this would be after Jesus' death, resurrection, and his ascension. Okay, and the group of followers were in the upper room. And in 1.14 it says, And all these followers were in one accord. So they're of one mind. They're, they're, they understand who Jesus is now, and they're beginning the church. They are of one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So his brothers eventually came around to believing him. And so why? I mean, what happened? I guess they, they, they would see from a distance everything that happened to Jesus um, and what he claimed to be. 
But probably the, the biggest thing for James, I would say, would be recorded by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. You remember when Paul says that um, he talks about how uh, the gospel, was according to his, Christ died according to the scriptures. Christ arose according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to 500 all at one time, and next he appeared to James, James his brother. So James had visualized, had seen the risen Christ. James had known what he had talked about. James uh, uh, had that experience that he had seen the risen Christ. His brother, uh, his brother that he grew up with, was who he said he was. And so then that maybe have been the deciding factor. Uh, we know that Christ is a deciding factor and the Spirit of God is a deciding factor, but that may have been when he maybe took off, became a leader uh, in the church. Now, Jesus also had some other brothers uh, that wrote um, the book of Jude. Uh, we know this because Jude said when, in his introduction, he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. And he's also listed when he was in Nazareth, and they're saying, isn't Jude one of his brothers as well? So he had other brothers as well. And then, like I said, uh, James became a leader of the, the Jerusalem church. And a couple of uh, ways we know that is kind of insinuated in Acts chapter 12. And you recall after, uh, after the other James got martyred, and they arrested Peter and put him in prison. Remember, he miraculously, the spirit escaped him, and he went out and he went back to uh, the house of Mary, who's the mother of John Mark, and they are all there praying for Peter to get out. A uh, servant girl comes to the door, sees it's Peter, and just kind of goes back in and tells everybody, I don't believe it's him. Uh, but finally they come back out, and then Peter says this, because they're all, you know, he just escaped from prison, so they probably wanted to be a little bit quiet about making a commotion. He says, but Peter, he motioned to them with his hand to be silent. He described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. It's anyway, and James is a leader in the church as well. It says, then he departed and went to another place. In Acts 15, which as you recall, was when the Jerusalem Council met. This was uh, some years later when they were trying to make some decisions as the Gentiles were being brought into the church. And do we make them follow the law of Moses? Do, we, do they need to be circumcised? All that. That's what they were all discussing. And when they were discussing that, they said, after they had finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. So James had a, had a way. He was in the lead of there as well. And in Acts 21, when Paul finally returned to Jerusalem right before he was imprisoned, um, he came in Acts 21, verse 18. Um, Paul went with us to James and the elders as well. So James is kind of listed as a leader in the church. So that's why we think it is James. But a couple of quick things in the last time we have left. When was the book written? Well, again, this is Bible scholar kind of stuff there. Uh, certainly before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, because Jerusalem was still there. Um, after the scattering, you know, when Saul was ravaging the church it, back in Acts chapter 8 and began uh, to scatter, because this is written to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Um, Probably before that, Jerusalem Council was about 50 A.D. Anyway, probably somewhere around 45 A.D., and it may be the earliest book written. Um, it's well written in Greek, and that's some, another thing that people have problems with, because if James was the son of a carpenter, he wouldn't be that educated. He wouldn't write in, in as good a Greek as he did. Uh, and that's one thing Calvin uses as a reason why he doesn't think James did it. So what type of man was he? Just quickly... He, tradition tells us he is, they t called him James the Righteous. He, uh, righteousness was what he preached all the time. We can tell he was a humble man because verse 1, he says he was a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a slave of God, not a servant of God. Um, and he could, have, you know, he could have introduced himself as, I'm the brother of Jesus. You know, I saw the risen Jesus. He could, he could use all those things, but he doesn't. He's a servant of God and Jesus Christ. So he's a humble man. But he had no fear. He, he didn't compromise on any of the things. As, as we get into reading them, many commands that you do, short sentences, easy to read and easy to understand, which is good with me, and it's pretty direct, okay? Uh, and his application is pretty much black and white. You do this, you don't do that. 
Um, he doesn't go into a whole lot of detail like Paul does in a lot of his things, um, but he can express that, that righteous anger. James the righteous, he does that. He died as a martyr, tradition, and it says in 62 AD. And his theology, some people said he really doesn't give much theology in the book, but as he writes and explains things, it's really clear that it demonstrates a true knowledge of the theology of Jesus as he goes. Concerning things, as I lifted there, suffering, sin, temptation, uh, demons, evil, wisdom, uh, prayer, law, grace, faith, works. Um, he was really a true pastor uh, of, the first, of the church there in uh, Jerusalem. But again, it was a difficult time. Not only was it a time of persecution of the church, it was a time of the Jews and the Gentiles coming together and all that that we've talked many times in church about. The problem was that, uh, that there was a, a lot of problems associated with that. So just kind of summing it up, uh, kind of using Jesus' sermon on the mount as a background for this letter, what it, what it looks like to have true salvation, what it looks like to be a true Christian, what that will play out as, um, that it comes from a changed heart and your works will flow out of that. Uh, James tells us this is the way we should act. And he's pretty direct about all of them. Um, and it comes from this regenerated heart. So it, it's, if this is the way we should act that, he, that he's telling us, we use it as a test to examine ourselves uh, for true salvation. So as we go through that, that's a lot of the, uh, that's what we'll be talking about mostly, what he says, why he says that. Uh, where it comes from and things like that. So let's pray. Father, we again thank you so much for your word that just clearly demonstrates who you are. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, James that we will be studying, and we pray that as we do that, that your, uh, that your word will become clear, that your spirit will uh, open our eyes and work in our hearts to examine ourselves uh, to see if we are in the faith. So, Lord, thank you again for this time. Uh, in your son's name, amen.